Hi everybody and welcome to the Soul Booth. If you've been here before, welcome back. This is David McGinley. This is his first time in the Soul Booth and I'm thrilled to have him here. David is a Lutheran minister, but um, I, I just coined the term, you're a wandering minister. Yes, very like, much. Like a wandering minstrel. Uh, yes, I do tend to wander, but it's not out in the wilderness. It's actually mm. through the hospital corridors. Some people would would see the the place you are often in as the wilderness, though. Yes. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Psychologically. It's, it's a, a terrifying place for many people. Okay, are you curious? Yes. Um, but I feel strangely at home there. When we first talked about doing this session together, um, David said, you know, what do you think you'll want to talk to me about? Because we were having a wide ranging uh, chat and it could, it could have gone anywhere in this, in this segment. But I had just seen a phrase that morning that caught my attention and I thought, that's what I want to talk to David McGinley about. And the phrase is joyful service. Mm -hmm. And when I mentioned it to you the first time, you had a very distinct reaction. Oh, yes. When you are giving from your heart, when you're living in your purpose, there is just uh, an equanimity and a vitality and an integrity and a spontaneity to your work that it, it just seems to naturally flow. You're aligned. When, mm -hmm. you, when you take your passion and you match it to a community's need, that's your vocation. That's joyful service. Um, you become a gift, right, to, to the world, but you're experiencing the world totally as gift. And your, your act of service is, it revitalizes you. And I, I certainly find that in my work. I'm a hospital chaplain. I work with cancer patients, palliative care, and intensive care. And I move daily through suffering. And because of that... Most people, I'm sure, who meet you for the first time must jump to the conclusion that what you do is depressing, depressing dark, dark, yeah, very difficult. The first thing they say, oh, my goodness, how could you do that day in, day out? Mm -hmm. It's the most astonishing privilege in the world. I support and witness people who are on the edge of immortality, who are wrestling with the unfinished love stories of their lives, who are facing a crisis that amplifies everything that is beautiful and broken. I mean, these stories pull you in and leave you overflowing with uh, just a sense of privilege for being there. That's in addition to working with an astounding medical team, nurses who are unbelievably wise and knowledgeable and deeply compassionate and doctors who have an astonishing encyclopedia of knowledge and then a support team and physios and OTs and PTs and I'm in there, spiritual care, integrated, part of the team. It's an incredible rush that um, I pinch myself. So it occurs to me that you are saving lives in a different way. Yeah, because really the word saved, mm -hmm. the word salvation in the church means to be whole, mm -hmm. not to survive mortal death and continue afterwards. That, that's the way it's tr traditionally used. But to be saved means I am now integrated. I am whole once again. Even if I'm broken, I'm not uh, suppressing or running from any aspect of myself. I can hold the whole mess with compassion and awareness. I'm not hiding from my story, right, mm -hmm. which is unfinished. And it's that ability to, to hold the broken parts tenderly, to, to name them accurately, to get that conversation flowing with those you love so nobody's hiding. Suddenly, our hearts are like this instead of like this. We're not hiding from each other or ourselves. But how do you get them? The people that you work with, how do you get them there? Because it's, it seems to me that some of them might hide from you literally when they first see you coming. And, and 
it's easy to see you coming because you're six eight. I'm six foot eight. <laughs> I'm the high priest, yes. right? They <laughs> see me coming down the hall. Everybody, and of course, if a chaplain walks into your room and you're in a hospital bed and he's six foot eight, what do you think? What's the first thought going through your head? The Grim Reaper. Oh my goodness, he's come to check my ticket and see which way I'm going. Oh, who sent the chaplain? The God guy's here. It must be bad. Oh, so I try to put them at ease. You ask me, how do I do that? Yeah. Nancy, to be honest, I'm trying to figure that out. I think you would do it with humor. It's a good tool. Yeah. It helps it helps set up a therapeutic conversation and sit down as soon as you can, right? Don't <laughs> loom over the bed. Uh, but the quality of my presence with myself mm -hmm. will determine the quality of my encounter with them. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I've got to do is show up. Authentically. Authentically. Compassionately. Mm -hmm. Not thinking about what I'm going to say, but genuinely caring, being curious, walking in, and it's not so much in what you say then, it's how you say it. It's those subtle cues, the body language, the tone of your voice, eye contact, how relaxed you are in your own skin. Mm -hmm. And I'm grateful that I, I seem to be able to go to the deep water pretty quick. Well, you've, you've swam in the deep water. Yeah, I've been there a few times. You've been in the deep end in terms of cancer. Uh, you're like a cat, really. How many lives do you think you have? Uh, well, if, if it's a cat, I got uh, five left. So yeah. I've, I've had cancer four times. Extraordinary, which which must buy you, sorry to say it this way, but some serious street cred <laughs> in your line of work, right? I actually don't tell the patients I have oh, you had don't? cancer. Not Not a... Sometimes I'll tell them if it's appropriate. Yeah. The nurse is usually the one who lets them know, um, which I appreciate. It builds a bridge, mm -hmm. right? But this is about them, not about me. And my empathy, my 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 twinship with their experience, it's going to come through because it's wired into me. Mm -hmm. I don't need to tell them, you know, all the time. Oh, I've had cancer, but when they do find out, they want to know, and I answer their questions. Do you want to tell us the story? Yeah, I was 17 years old and um, got up one morning and I was hemorrhaging. So I uh, rushed to the hospital. It turned out I had a tumor inside. And um, it was removed uh, surgically and, and uh, diagnosed as something called, um, I don't know, what do they call it? Non-chromatophin parenting ganglioma. So non-chromatophin is referring to the genetic type within it and paranganglioma. It was a small tumor about the size of an almond. We didn't realize at the time that it was a dangerous tumor. Mm -hmm. These tumors make a Molotov cocktail of chemicals. They're called catecholamines. They're very dangerous. And they exist in small quantities in your body, but mine was making hundreds of times the dose. And when your adrenal gland turns on, because of pleasure or pain, mm -hmm. it triggers the tumor to explode. Most people die instantly. Makes the heart burst, makes the blood pressure go crazy. At the very least, you have an anxiety attack, peripheral flush, racing heart, tachycardia. Um, I had unusual symptoms. My fingernails would turn blue, poor circulation turned out to be excess calcium and uh, constriction in the capillaries. My heart would race briefly, but more often I got dizzy and lightheaded and my blood pressure went down. That was called a vasovagal response. Anyway, 17 years old, they got it out and that gave me a new sense of life and woke me up. So I became um, a little more bold in my living. Instead of a shy introvert, I decided to just do whatever I wanted to do. <laughs> Now, instead of behaving like a normal 17-year-old should behave with that attitude, <laughs> I went to university and studied philosophy and world religions because I wanted to find out why. Mm -hmm. So I can appreciate what some of the things that my patients go through. So have you, have you gotten to a place where you don't worry about this happening again? Or is it likely to happen again? Four times around the block. I'm not going to be naive about it. Yeah. I watch, I test every year. 
I know the symptoms. Mm -hmm. But this is the longest remission I've ever had, 13 years. Yeah. Maybe it's because you're in joyful service. It could be. They say, I hear a lot of patients say, it must be a reason I got the cancer, right? Mm -hmm. And if I get my head right, maybe I can overcome the cancer. That mind-body connection mystery. Which makes me think I must be pretty thick-headed if I got it four times. <laughs> I'm just not getting the lesson. <laughs> It puts a lot of pressure uh, on you as well in terms of taking responsibility for yeah. your own illness. Yeah. yeah. But my conclusion, though, is while all illness is fundamentally begins with an aberration within consciousness on an energetic level, that is not independent of the environment. We live in an incredibly toxic environment. And... Um, the, the variables that feed into disease like cancer are just too complex. And you can't reduce it just to, I didn't love my mother. Mm -hmm. right? Is that why I got cancer? Or there must be a divine reason in this. Yeah. Those are good questions, but those are expressions of how we're wrestling with meaning and mortality and trying to put some handles on the chaos so we can drive it a little bit. So that's what you do. I love that. You put handles on the chaos so people can navigate their way through this right. this difficult path. It feels like the bottom just got pulled out of life, right? And patients need to know that they're still in the driver's seat of their life. They have agency in this. Mm -hmm. And that's not just about the power of positive thinking or saying the right prayers, right? Uh, it's fundamentally about clarifying the values. What are my goals? What do I want to live? What animates me? What gives me purpose? Coming back to vocation mm -hmm. and the joy of service, right? A person who has a why can deal with any how to live. That's Viktor Frankl. Mm -hmm. If I have a why, I can endure suffering more than my imagination thinks that I can. It's almost the end justifies the means. Well, <laughs> in a twisted, kind, in a of, twisted way. kind of way. Yeah. yeah. I want to tap into uh, the ultimate why. Where's your fighting energy coming from? And it's always coming from the same place. The unfinished love stories. Mm -hmm. The number one concern on a patient's mind is not their death. It's the burden of care upon their loved ones. I don't want to put my family through this. They're worried so much. I just feel that weight. And that speaks of their good love. Mm -hmm. They have good love. And the second concern then, of course, is suffering. I don't want to suffer. Theirs and their families, I bet. Yeah. Because they, they, I can't help but think they would be consumed by the idea of the suffering their family will or would go through right. if they die. So many, some patients, not many, some patients won't tell their family how difficult it is. But there's a secret world inside. They are wrestling with mortality. They are going through the checklist. Even with a very treatable cancer, people do this. Mm -hmm. I'm a safe guy that they can sit with and talk about and wrestle with it. Out loud. And they probably realize fairly quickly that they can say almost anything to you. And they do. Because you're not the average minister. Can I, I say that? I, I don't have a lot of starch in my collar, if that's what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> you have a floppy collar. He's, a, mini a, floppy he's a minister with a floppy collar. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's, um, well, because I'm an interfaith chaplain, right? Yes, and that's what I was going to say. You must deal with a lot of people in the hospital. You've got all faiths. Yeah. And the wonderful thing, I think, is that you arrive in a room trained in all sorts of different denominations, Yes. for instance. Well, if you are Jewish yeah. and you are dealing with cancer and you're wondering, what can I do, you know, my... What can I do? My thoughts are driving me crazy. My imagination is painful to me. I'm worried about my family. So we will discuss tukun ulam, which is to repair the world. And, and it's a meditation. It's a, it's a whole perspective on life that you can use your suffering through compassion 
to repair, re reunify the consciousness of your community. In the Buddhist community, uh, that's Tonglen. So Tonglen is a word that means receiving and giving. Mm -hmm. I'm going to sit and first I'm going to do a body scan. I'm going to tune in because my body won't lie to me. My, my mind will do anything to deceive me, but my body will tell me the truth. So I'll scan my body. Ah, I'm holding emotional energy here. That's where my pain is. If you can accurately name the pain, then using Tonglen, I will instruct the patient, I want you to take in more pain. I want you to take on everybody's problem. Breathe in that pain from all the patients on this floor. Add it to yours, because mm. you're the expert in this. Mm -hmm. But when you breathe out, I want you to send your compassion to those patients. It's easier to be compassionate for someone else than it is for yourself. Mm -hmm. So we're using suffering to shift your relationship to your own experience of suffering. Now, one patient said, why would I do that? It, it, it could make my cancer grow. It could make me worse. And I said, boy, you must be a very powerful person. You must be really good at this. <laughs> so I did it with them. Transformative effect. In the Christian tradition, that's called redemptive suffering. Mm -hmm. right? I offer my suffering to Christ. Right? I receive his compassion back. I pray for others and I offer that suffering. It's the same thing. It's in many religions. Mm -hmm. So you must encounter a huge um, spectrum Yes. in terms of people's relationship with God, source, yeah. the universe, and, and some people who, who have no spirituality None. at all, probably. None. I don't know how many people say to me, as soon as I say, I'm the chaplain, they go, oh, uh, um, I haven't been to church in a very long time, right? Yeah. I tell them, well, it's been a few weeks for me, too. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they think it's about religion, yeah. right? Most people do. It's the old model. And it's so not. It's so not. It's so not. It's, and when we talk about spirituality, even if we use that word, what is it? Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? We're still talking, usually, in terms of that concept of an external God. But all healthy religious traditions, spiritual teachings, say the realm of the divine is within you. Mm -hmm. if, uh, if you want to connect to that source... You're already plugged in. Your consciousness is the only real estate you share with God. Oh, I love that. Right? And what that says to me is that the reason when we can feel our own light, yes. that's when we start to figure it out. Ooh. You know, my, my um, way of putting it is that for years I worked on television and people were shining a spotlight on me and I never felt my own light. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a real sense of confidence and I, I you know, was worried about not uh, being perfect and, and not coming across well and always focusing on what I was doing wrong because no matter how much light was shone on me, I didn't feel it. Right. But when I, when I came closer to 50 and did a lot of reading and, and sort of thinking and investigating... All of a sudden, I started to feel my own light. And that's part of what this project is about. Because yeah, so for me, it's about looking at other people and talking to people who are bringing light and who are so clearly in touch with their own inner light. Call that, you know, whatever you like, spirituality, or if it's part of your religion. Um, but it's really about our relationship with ourselves. Yes. And that's what Anne Berube Right. was touching on in her interview. Yeah. Do I completely love and accept myself? Mm -hmm. Do I see myself as a beautiful, unique expression of the divine consciousness? Right. And religion has moved with attention through that theme, sometimes using guilt and power and the, the language of theology and doctrine. And that becomes the pressure point. Well, I don't, you know, a patient will say, I don't believe that. And... I often get some funny looks because I'll say to them, here's a radical idea. What if your spirituality was not determined by what you believed? What if it was determined instead by how you love? Beautiful. Because God is love. It's not something God does. It's what God is. Taking that back to your work with cancer patients right. and end of life yes. as well, 
I'm sure you are often asked the question, what do you believe happens after we die? Yeah. That's it. Not, not to throw too big a question at you, David, but what does happen after we die? Uh, I'm going to sound arrogant, but I can handle that question. Oh, okay. I'm ready. Because I had a peak. Second round with cancer, I died. Mm -hmm. It was ironically during a church service in a hospital chapel that I died. Really scared everyone who was there. It's not good for the minister to collapse in the middle of a sermon. And nurses were there, and they, my heart stopped. And they had to, they had to fight and get me back. You know the stories, the near-death experience, the dark tunnel, the light at the end, and all of that. Um, those are the predominant ones. Uh, I hear those stories just about every week at the hospital. Really? Often it's from someone who had an, a near-death experience years earlier, and they, they confide in me. But sometimes, I'd say about 20% of the time, it's the patient who had it right there a few days ago. And I remember, I found myself transported to a grassy hill, and I was filled with a sense of being home. And it was like a kid at Christmas. I was overjoyed, and I kept saying, I'm home, I'm home, I'm home. I was thrilled. And the light was coming from everywhere, not from a star above me. And the colors and everything was saturated and I was indescribably happy and there was a an entity you could call it an angel I wish I took a peek at him <laughs> it was a distinctly masculine character but I didn't look at him and so was it a sense of feeling that presence oh yeah rather than seeing okay oh yeah um I didn't I didn't turn and look at him but he felt like my best friend and he said it's good to see you David I said, yeah, I'm home. He said, yep, but you can't stay. I didn't, I ignored that. I just kept saying, I'm home. And he said, you're doing good work, but there's a lot more work to do. So you're going to have to go back. Well, we discussed that. Um, yeah. It was a negotiation. <laughs> well, I knew I wasn't going to win. Um, he said, you, you got to go back. And I, ended up, I woke up, right? And it was awful. He didn't say why. He just said, you have a lot more work to do. Oh. Right? So this is what's called a stage one near-death experience. I, I, I didn't see the spirits of loved ones. I didn't see... Um, I wasn't given special knowledge. Right? I saw this beautiful grassy hill. It's unique to each individual. Everyone apprehends it and it's presented to them according to... Perhaps what would make sense for them, but the overall themes are all similar. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part is coming back, is being back. And I've never, I've felt homesick ever since. But it's amazing because look what you've done with your remaining time, I think your I'm, second chapter. I think I'm doing the work he was talking about. Amazing. Yeah. Well... Where do we go from there? Thank you. <laughs> David, you're coming back to the Soul Booth. My pleasure. I'd love to. Okay. That was a statement. It wasn't a question. Oh. Whether you want to or not, you're coming back to the Soul Booth. Yes, Nancy. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. My pleasure.